Kia ora koutou katoa, no mai hara mai ki UFC on Sky, Korovinda Hunia, aho. Our New Zealand UFC fighters have been doing spectacular things in the octagon of late and we have plenty more of Kiwi action to come in the months ahead and here to give us an update on that is City Kickboxing head coach Eugene Beerman. Eugene, kia ora and welcome back to the show. Hi Rob, thanks for having me, yeah it's good to be back. Awesome. Look, we're just going to, as I said, get a quick little update on what's been going on. But I first wanted to talk to you about Carlos Olberg and his win a couple of weeks back at UFC Charlotte and what a spectacular result that was for him and, of course, for the gym. Yeah, no, that was, uh, I mean, that, that was almost a flawless performance from Carlos. So uh, the coaching staff had no complaints and the team was happy. And, um, yeah, he, he's just forging ahead, uh, you know, into the making his way closer and closer to the top of that division. And uh, he's just getting better and better as uh, as time goes by. So he's doing everything that we need him to do at this stage. Good. He's three years deep now into his UFC career. And, you know, after that spectacular, you know, first glimpse of him on Dana White's Contender Series, how what have you made of his, you know, journey so far and now knocking on the door at a top 15 ranking? Yeah, I mean, I think Carlos, I think... The change for Carlos was after the, his uh, debut where he understood that his athleticism has to be backed up by his skills and his IQ. And ever since that fight, he's made um, massive steps to um, kind of make up for the shortfall and some of his technique and his IQ around the fight. And I think you can see that um, coming across in the fights that he's had recently so he he in terms of like his journey i think he's where he exactly where he should be at about this mark about the three-year mark just knocking on the door of um some of those top guys is there anyone in mind or any you know any wheel and turning at the moment for him in terms of his next fight and a possible opponent uh no no one no one really in mind but um you know like maybe not quite a top 15 guy yet but uh, maybe one step away from that so maybe um yeah maybe just another really good up and coming contender like himself um would be the perfect matchup for him is he a possibility for ufc sydney eugene i hope so mm. yeah I, I hope um i hope mick can get him a good match at ufc sydney um yeah that that's that's what we're hoping for Nice one. Hey, look, uh, we've got Kai Kata France. He's, you know, next on the roster to go uh, next weekend at the UFC Apex, headlining that event against Amir Albazi. How has have, how have his preparations been going? Uh, Kai's, yeah, I mean, Kai's a consummate professional, so um, he's done. Yeah, his preparations gone perfect. He's managed to stay uh, injury free, and he, like all these guys. Um, turns it up on that last um those last couple of weeks are the the key the key kind of time in their camp where they really start to flick the switch and you see them go to another level so he's done that his weight's down low um his preparation is um near perfect so um well i'm looking forward to uh outstanding performance and an important performance for him both in the scheme of the landscape of the UFC, but just mentally um, coming back from the title fight loss. And why do you say that? You know, was there, you know, some, I mean, after a loss, you, I mean, you don't want to lose a fight like that of that magnitude, I suppose, but you know how, because then he came back and he was injured and so he was nursing that for a little while as well. So talk about that coming back because that would have been a big, you know, kind of trial for Kai knowing that, you know, that fight was the one. Yeah, and just, uh, I think we felt as a team that uh, Kai, and I guess this, I guess you should feel this, but we just found that he had the capabilities to win that fight. Like mm. he was well matched against Moreno and he kind of got caught. And even watching the fight, we felt that what we were trying to do with the fight, what we were trying to impose, um, we saw some really early evidence that um, that fight was starting to turn our way. And given all that it just makes it a little bit more devastating and mentally hard to come back from given that um those are some of the things that we saw afterwards he got a back injury um 
which is difficult because Kai's a person that doesn't like to be inactive, so mm-hmm. he, <laughs> he had to deal with that. But I also think that that's part of it's it's part and parcel of him just evolving as a person, having to deal with that adversity, having to understand that he might need to occupy himself with something else other than um, this great sport he loves so much and he was able to explore other opportunities that he has and obviously and and the other benefit is he gets to spend a bit more time with his family so I feel like he bounced back from that injury quite well I think the much harder thing to deal with was just knowing that he came he was so close to that title um, and it just eluded him and um, hopefully he's just using that as motivation now to get back to that lofty position again and put himself um, in a position to fight for the title again. Absolutely, because he's still, you know, very much well and truly in the mix, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, the flyweight division is such that uh, it's the smallest division in the sport, um, apart from a couple of the female divisions, um, but it's the smallest men's division in the sport um, that you're always within uh, one or two wins away from the title um, when you're in the top 10, top 15, so um, like I said, if he wins this and then he can win another good one, they could be talking about his name uh, again in terms of um, title contention. Absolutely, and that's something that we've heard, you know, Figueredo and Brandon Moreno, uh, uh, Kai's always in the conversation, so it's exciting to think, you know, what a win here will do for him. Yep, yep, mm. yep, yep. Kai needs, a, Kai needs a good, impressive one over this guy, and, um, um, he, you know, he's mentioned in the same conversation um when it comes to title shots. So Absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned that he's had an opportunity to do other things. Of course, we know he is the wrestling coach uh, with the Warriors at the moment, alongside with John Vake. Have you seen somewhat of a, you know, maybe like a bit of a transformation or a blossoming in Kai to know that he's been able to put, you know, his strengths and knowledge of, you know, MMA and wrestling into something else and have that outlet? Oh, no, 100%. Like, you don't... You don't truly realize the breadth of your knowledge and how good you are at something until you have to teach other people. Mm. And I think that's the strength of what Kai's doing. He's realized that um, there is a lot of things that he knows and the, um, he is really good at certain aspects of the sport. And just sometimes it's, you just need that. You just have to teach someone else to realize that you have accumulated an awful lot of knowledge and, and, and some really useful skills over the years. And I think that's what Teaching the Warriors has done for him. It's just reminded him that um, he has an enormous breadth of knowledge and um, as well as the satisfaction of just helping them um, do do pretty good this season. I mean, I heard mm-hmm. they've been doing pretty well. Um, they'll probably make the top eight, so it's good, good for Kai to know and us to know that maybe he's had a small part to play in that. Yeah, nice one. And what has it been like? Because the, the team have sometimes been coming into city kickboxing as well. So what does that do for the environment as well? Oh, no, it's cool to have uh, it's cool to have the boys around in the gym sometimes. And it's good for them to have a change of environment. But mm. it's also good to see, um, you know, these guys are they're high level athletes at the top of their field. They, they have a lot of things in common. And, and one of the most common things is just their drive. You know, when they when they come to training, that's their job, and they have uh, their desire and their drive and their motivation to train hard. Is that's inspiring um, for us to see that there's other other athletes and other sports that are doing exactly the same thing as us. It's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, Eugene, I know that you'll be um, heading over to Melbourne. Um, you have a fighter, Kevin Newset, who'll be featuring on the Hex series over there this weekend. But when do you get ready to, for the for the Apex in Las Vegas? Um, yes, yeah, so yeah, I fly over to Kevin. He's got a really, um, he's a guy who's been on the outer edge of trying to make the UFC uh, for quite a number of years now, and he's a very, very good fighter, and uh, he, he has uh, the capabilities to fight at the highest level. Um, he just has to uh, put it all together, so I just go and corner him on Saturday, but then I fly across to Brisbane uh, on Friday, then I fly across to Brisbane because i got a I got a, a, a lady called Gina G, who's a professional mm-hmm. fighter and another amateur f- fighting in Brisbane. And then from Brisbane, the next day I fly back to Auckland. And then the next day I fly out to Las Vegas. So that's on Monday I fly out to Las Vegas. Um, so I got a busy couple of days. <laughs> 
but I will leave for the Apex on um, Sunday with uh, our other wrestling coach, Andre. So he'll be well taken care of, and he'll go over a couple of days earlier before me just to... It's just good to acclimatise for mm-hmm. those guys to get there early. Not going to do much. Just They're basically just going to rest and get over the little bit of jet lag they have. And then uh, I can just come in and just kind of um, fit in after they've been well rested. I don't... I don't get jet lag because I travel too much. <laughs> you live on a plane <laughs> these days, Eugene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, there's, as we mentioned off camera, there's so many exciting fights coming up. And then you've got International Fight Week with Dan Hooker. Alexander Volkanovsky will be, of course, headlining that event. Dan Hooker, I feel, is like an interesting one in, in your gym because there were conversations that I had with him in New York about um, that he's looking at you know, his fight career in the UFC in kind of a different light now that, you know, he has full trust in his camp, that it's a it's a we thing, it's not a me thing, um, to ensure that success while in that city kickboxing camp. What have you made of, of Dan Hooker, and do you see this change in him? Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, I got her. Yeah. Dan's, Dan's always been an important part of the team. Hmm. Um, Maybe, maybe he just, maybe it's just having a better understanding of uh, the work that goes into preparing him and and the team for fights is very um, thorough and mm. diligent, and it doesn't leave any stones unturned. And if you trust that and you do everything that we're asking you to do in terms of the strategy and the tactics and leading up to the fight, then we believe that that is your best chance to be successful. And um, maybe maybe um, we didn't always have his complete buy-in on that, but um, yeah, maybe we do now. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe that's just a process in his own head that he's had to work out for himself, kind of outside of our input. Yeah. And if he's found himself in a good place, then uh, I mean, I'm happy for him. Um, he, he's one of the world's best uh, lightweights and still uh, has the capability to beat any of any lightweight in the world on his on his night if he puts it all together. So. Um, yeah, I'm happy for him if he's um, if he's found a good mental space for him to be in. Yeah, and I think it comes with growth and maturity and all those sorts of things as well because it's, it's easy to say things about fighters, but, man, when you think about how long Dan has been in the UFC, he's kind of grown into the man that he is today in front of all our eyes, you know, in front of the camera and in the octagon. Yeah, I mean, fighters... The different of fighters when you stop evolving uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally, uh, skill-wise, and uh, the good fighters, they constantly evolve. Uh, the Dan, when he first got in the UFC, is 100% a, a different man in so many different ways to the one he is now. And um, if your involvement um, leads to you becoming a better fighter, then that's then, then you've done the right job. Um, mm-hmm. When that involvement becomes kind of static and starts to um, plateau out, I mean, that's when you get yourself in trouble mm. and you stop getting the results that you need. So um, it's in a good place, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And how has his preparation been for his upcoming um, fight against Jalen Turner, who is, you know, when I think of, um, and I said this to Dan when he was on the show a couple of weeks back, when I think of limbs, I think of Jalen Turner and Dan Hooker. There's going to be limbs flying everywhere when it comes to this fight. So how do you prepare uh, Dan Hooker for a fighter like Jalen Turner? Who are the people that you bring in to mimic that sort of a fighter? I, I mean, we're, we're quite lucky at the gym. I, I, I'm always... I'm always pretty lucky at this gym. Uh, we have uh, we have enough fighters at a high enough quality that we can always provide someone with some similarities. You're never going to get exact carbon copies of these guys in the UFC because they're all unique in their own different way. Because um, that that's how they get to the top. That's why they're some of the best fighters in, in the world. But I've always got a good stock of guys that can match in some way or another um, some of the skills of. Uh, everybody's different opponents. So 
Now, I've got a couple of young fellas uh, who are, who are left, natural left-handers um, who will be working a lot with um, Dan. And then, of course, um, uh, Izzy makes a very good mm. uh, southpaw. He, he's a guy who can fight orthodox and southpaw, and when we need him to be a southpaw in a situation like this, um, he's always a really good southpaw um, who can spar, who does a lot of sparring and training with Dan. Yeah, so just just getting him on there and um, getting him amongst all the southpaws that we have in our gym, and then just letting that just going through with those southpaws the looks that we need to see and and going over some of um, you know going going over some of Jalen's strengths and weaknesses with those sparring partners, and if they can mimic a couple of things that Jalen does, so that Dan gets a little bit of insight into in, into that, then. That's all they need to do. That that that's 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 them achieving their job uh, in mm. terms of the camp. So, yeah. Not saying that you don't concentrate on the ground game, but how much concentration has been put in that in that aspect for Dan in this camp? Uh well, just equally as much as we do for everybody. And like uh, you got to remember, like nowadays, nowadays, uh, whether you like it or not, you have to be prepared to be taken down and react and also you never know when even if it's not a primary part of your game plan you never know when the situation will call for you to have to execute a takedown and um show some top dominance um you just never know so that i mean just as much as we do for any camp and it's yeah it's a it's a, it's a lot we spend a lot of time on um wrestling uh control on top and scrambling from bottom so it's kind of i think Nice. Okay, and finally, um, Eugene, Israel Adesonia, of course we know he had um, his spectacular win in recapturing the middleweight title against Alex Pereira, and as we had that discussion last time, you were mentioning that he wants to get back into the octagon quick, smart, and now there is the announcement of UFC Sydney. So what is the likelihood of us seeing Izzy at UFC Sydney? I think, I, think, um, I mean, Izzy's... Preferably like to get in there before then, mm. um, but there just doesn't seem to be any opportunities available for him at the moment. And then I think I think Sydney's a very real possibility, especially if um, the South African wins. Um, obviously, we've never fought the South African, and there's a little bit of a story developing behind Israel and the South African. There's a story there. Uh, there's, a, there's a rivalry there. Um, and then Robert might win, and yeah. Because what happens if? Because what happens if Robert wins? You know, when they're saying that they're teeing up the next, you know, possible fight against Izzy, and Robert comes back for, for fight number three, does that kind of leave you guys stuck in the mud with that, or do you must have to go in and fight him again? Uh, maybe. Mm. Maybe we have to fight Robert a third time. <laughs> How many wins does he, uh, Robert? Uh, um, uh, to be honest, I. Like, I really haven't looked at that possibility because I just didn't. Uh, uh, I, I mean, because Robert, how many wins has he had since we last fought him? Yeah, I don't think he's lost, but I don't think he's. How many wins? I think, I, yeah. I think from him, one. So he, yeah. He's basically just. We fought him and he's been in the ring one time since mm. then. Whereas we've just keep trucking on. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I don't know. At, at what point do you. Yeah. I mean, we. Izzy, and we, we are who we are. Like it's just, you just put the opponent in front of us, and then um, uh, we'll, we'll fight. Mm. We'll fight. I mean, our preference is not to fight Robert again because we've obviously already beaten Robert twice, and he hasn't really done anything since that loss to warrant him fighting again. So our preference would be the South African. But then the South African has to get across the line, and obviously he's got a very tough opponent, um, and Robert to fight. But um, I think the more important thing is that um, we're and we're fighting in Sydney, and um, if that means having to fight Robert again, then it's just what we have to do. Mm. If he's uh, if he's the next best available choice. When you do look at the middleweight division and the landscape of it all, who would be? Because I know last time we spoke, you mentioned Strickland, but who do you think is, you know, to say a threat in the middleweight division for Izzy right now, or you know, 
a good opponent for him to face next? <laughs> well, it just starts to become, at a certain point, um, these guys that have been champions for this long, you start to roll out all the people that they've fought and they've mm. they beat, dominantly beat. So um, sometimes it's not all about the best fighter, it's about what fight's available. And I don't know, it, whoever he hasn't fought, <laughs> whoever he hasn't fought and convinced Slim pickings, like, Eugene. <laughs> for, yeah, and that's the thing. But from him in, like, I mean, Driscus, hopefully he can... Um, get himself a win because we haven't fought him and um, Sean Strickland's coming off a win if he can get another one um, otherwise you're looking at fighting guys like three times four times it's just it's um, a little bit ridiculous so I mean it's not really that's not an Israel problem that's a problem to do with the division and that those guys need to people need to put themselves forward that's how you become a champion you, you put yourself forward you fight you do quick turnarounds, you fight whoever they put in front of you, um, you don't get injured, you fight through injuries, you put yourself, when you're a contender, there's, when you're a champion, there's certain liberties you get, I guess, but when you're a contender, you've got to just, you're you're in a scrap, you're in a, you're in a proper, you're fighting for the bone, you're fighting all the other dogs for the bone, so you've really got to get in there and scrap for it and separate yourself from the rest and put yourself as the number one guy. If there's a card that um, Izzy wants to be on before Sydney, which one would you be likely looking at? <laughs> you see, remember, people... I don't know anything about the UFC. Okay. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't know what cards are coming up. I know only there's three... At the moment, there's only three fighters I know about. They're Jalen Turner, they're um, Rodriguez, and they're um, uh, Albazi. Mm. Uh, and those are the only three fighters that I have anything to do with. I don't know when the events are. I even forget when Dan and them are fighting. Yeah. My full concentration goes on those three fighters and my guys. And I wouldn't know what events are coming up. I don't watch any... UFC unless there's something particularly interesting on so the, uh, the short answer is I don't know what <laughs> coming out and fair enough you do have a lot on your plate mate <laughs> <laughs> I was trying my luck <laughs> any give us eight weeks any event within eight weeks yeah we need an eight week camp mm -hmm. and then anything with the, anything outside of the eight weeks in weeks, 12 weeks. If there's any events coming up, we'll do it. Nice one. Look, I'll leave it at that, Eugene. Always a pleasure uh, to have your time and, and your whakaro, your thoughts on, on these upcoming fights. So very much appreciated and please travel safe over these next few days. Cool. Thanks, Rav. Good to talk to you. So Fano, plenty of action coming your way in the coming months, but next up will be flyweight Kaikara France up against Amir Albazi. All the action will be coming live and direct from the UFC Apex in Las Vegas. You can catch all the action June the 4th, next Sunday, or live on ESPN. Matewa. The UFC is back with top 10 ranked flyweights. Former title challenger Kai Kara France is on the hunt for his 15th career finish by stopping the dangerous Iraqi standout, Amir Albazi. Undefeated in the UFC and looking to propel himself into title contention. Plus, a full card of can't miss action. Don't miss UFC Fight Night on ESPN and ESPN Plus.